aviation has played a huge part of our nation's heritage, whether it be war or commercial or pushing the limits of science, it turns out we as a society owe a great deal to all things mechanical flight. Here at the South Yorkshire Aircraft Museum, you can find out the marvellous mechanics of all the famous aircraft and the roles they played in key world events, but not just them. You can also find out about the older, more forgotten about aircraft, the ones that really paved the way for the aircraft that we know and use today. Here, we can really celebrate our nation's aviation heritage. In 1934, an aviation centre was established. Not two years later, the first flight from here to Amsterdam was flown. But that was to change very soon. War was imminent. And in 1939, the RAF took over here and made it RAF Doncaster. It was to serve as a scatter station throughout the Second World War until civilian flights were returned and it closed in 1992. This museum opened here in Doncaster in 1999 under the name AeroVenture after moving from its home in Furbeck. And what a fitting location. These buildings are the last surviving buildings of RAF Doncaster. It's undeniable that Doncaster has never seen the sky as the limit with its own RAF base, airport and aircraft museum. But the town's aviation history stretches before the Second World War, before the First World War even. You see, Doncaster, the racecourse specifically, was chosen as the location for the UK's first ever air races. It lasted from the 15th until the 26th of October and attracted nearly 160,000 visitors. But there was only really one aircraft that stood out from those air races. And it was this, the Blario 11 monoplane. This is a replica of the Blario 11 monoplane. First produced in January 1909, it was manufactured by French inventor Louis Blario. Whilst looking like any old plane, this is actually the oldest flying aircraft in the world. And in 1909 alone, this one propeller wonder shook the world twice. On the 25th of July 1909, this little plane made aviation history. It flew 21 miles now that might not seem like much today but back then it was the location that was important louis blerio who invented the plane started in calais in france he flew at 4 41 a.m on a worryingly brisk windy morning he then flew through some turbulence and ended up in north fall meadow in dover yep this is the plane that first crossed the english channel now, you can get from here, Doncaster, to Paris in an hour nowadays, but back then, that was massive. Speaking of Doncaster, the Blerio helped a different pilot break another record right here at the 1909 air races, not three months after this plane crossed the channel for the first time. The pilot in question was Leon Delagrange, another French pilot. The date was October 17th, 1909 not two days into the Doncaster air races. The odds were stacked against him. It was an infamously stormy morning. And yet, on that day, that brave pilot and this plucky little aircraft actually broke a world record. He flew six miles in seven minutes and 36 seconds. 50 miles per hour might not seem much to us nowadays, but back then, that was enough for Delagrange's career to take off if you'll pardon the pun. Sadly, Leon's career was tragically cut short and in cruel irony, it was because of a Blerio. On the 4th of January, 1910, he was piloting his aircraft over Bordeaux, France. It was terribly stormy and he was not to have the same luck that he had had at the air race. 
the wings collapsed and Leon came crashing to the ground with his skull crushed by the motor of the monoplane. Despite this tragic end to Leon and to his aircraft, I think it's really indisputable just how amazing this old boy actually is. Yes, it's not as famous as a Concorde or a Spitfire, but this is like the grandfather of aviation. It kind of paved the way for aeroplanes to come and the ones that we use today. Speaking of Spitfires, this museum actually has its own little warbird, one not as famous as the Spitfire per se, but one with a very different and very vital role. And that aircraft was an Oster Mark I. When we think of Second World War aeroplanes, we tend to think the usual. Spitfires, Lancaster bombers, Hurricanes. However, the Oster here played a very different and yet very vital role in the aerial theatre of war. Oster was a British aircraft manufacturer with a short but a very important life. They began production of aeroplanes in 1938, yet ceased only 23 years later. During the Second World War, about 1,600 of these little beauties were built. Their role was as an AOP, an Air Observation Post. AOPs were highly manoeuvrable aircraft that were flown by pilots of the Royal Artillery. Their task was to fly high above the battles and behind enemy lines, to direct the artillery below and locate the targets that were needed to be bombed. They were used in North Africa, Italy and even the Normandy landings. But this was no easy task. In fact, it was incredibly dangerous. Osters were invariably used as AOPs because they were quite slow. They had a top speed of about 120 miles per hour. To put that in perspective, Spitfires had a speed of around 370. So, naturally, it made them fairly easy targets. Their slow speed was great for getting pictures of the battlefield and a clearer image of where needed to be bombed, but there were losses. However, one of the biggest cause of losses for the Osters was actually friendly fire. AOPs were often hit by artillery from their own side. Osters were considered perfect choices for the role of an AOP. Their slow speed was actually a bonus and they were small and light, making them easy to manoeuvre. Plus, because AOPs had to take off sometimes from makeshift runways, which included nearby fields and the like, the Osters' short takeoff and landing proved them invaluable on the battlefield. This Oster behind me right here is actually really at home at the South Yorkshire Aircraft Museum. You see, in 1942, it was stationed at RAF Furbeck, where this museum actually used to live before moving here, the former site of RAF Doncaster. So, at 78 years old, I guess you could say this AOP is a bit of an OAP. This is a Westland Wessex HU-5. Wessexes were first used by the Royal Navy in 1961 before being used by the RAF. They were mostly recognised as search and rescue helicopters. They were British built and turbine powered, with later models using two Rolls-Royce Gnome engines. They were also recognised for their frequent use in the Falklands War. The Falklands War was a conflict between Argentina and England, lasting from the 2nd of April 1982 until the 14th of June. It was fought as a result of Argentina invading the English colony of the Falkland Islands. Argentina had claimed sovereignty in the 1800s and thought England would not retaliate with force. They did. By the end of the war, three Falkland citizens had died, with 255 British and approximately 650 Argentinian servicemen killed. This type of aircraft, the HU-5, was heavily used during the Falklands War. With the capability of carrying about 12 fully armed men, it was renowned as being a somewhat reliable piece of machinery, even in the harsh conditions of the Argentinian climate. One of the main uses of the HU-5 in the war was the transportation and insertion of special forces, including the SAS, 
approximately 55 HU-5 served during the Falklands War. Of those 55, 8 were destroyed. Two HU-5s crashed during an attempt to get SAS from South Georgia on the 22nd of April. During a horrific snowstorm, they crashed into the Fortuna Glacier. And then, on the 25th of May, the British merchant navy ship, the SS Atlantic Conveyor, was struck by two Argentinian missiles. 12 soldiers lost their lives. Three days later, while under tow, the ship sunk, and with it, sunk six HU-5s. This Westland Wessex here is, of course, not one of the wrecked helicopters. And whilst this is the only HU-5 here at the museum, there's certainly more here than just these few aircraft you've seen. And much like the Wessex, there are so many more stories that have been preserved here. Armed.